In this video, we're going to use the trajectory that we computed with the Lorentz simulator in NumPy to derive the so-called Lorentz map, which shows the relation between two subsequent peaks in the set direction. We're going to derive that for our particular trajectory and then discuss it. The channel sponsor Pasteur Labs is currently hiring SciML and software engineering positions. Check out pasteurlabs.ai slash careers for more details. Hi and welcome to this follow-up video on the Lorenz simulator. I just quickly want to recap what we did in the last one. So let me go up. There we looked at the Lorenz equations, which is a system of nonlinear ODEs, which is the prototypical example of so-called deterministic chaos meaning that it exhibits a strong dependency on the initial condition and it also shows very intricate shapes in its state space like this butterfly chaotic attractor we saw. We simulated the Lorentz equation by defining a state vector and a simulator which steps from one time step to the next and our method of choice was the runge gutta 4 scheme. We implemented this as the autoregressive time stepper, then unrolled the trajectory and ultimately we were able to visualize and admire this wonderful butterfly shape. For this video, we are now interested in extracting some quantities or some interesting other plots from this trajectory. And in particular, we are interested in the ratio between two subsequent maxima in the set coordinate. So what does that mean? So take a look at this axis, which is corresponding to the set coordinate. And then imagine you were at this point on the trajectory up here, which likely, it's a bit hard to see with the projection, but let's assume it is a local maximum and set. So the step in the time forward in time and backward in time have lower set value. And then you follow the trajectory. So let's say it goes in that direction. And then you end up here, which would be the next local set maximum. It's because the time step after and the time step before would be smaller in set value. And so you record these two set values. And then we are interested in what is the value of the next local set maximum after we've been at that. So let's say, for instance, this one is around 40. And then assuming this one is around 25 or 30 or 35, let's do 30. And so you basically say that after 40 comes a local maximum in 30. And this is exactly what is described here in this chart that I took from the original Lorentz paper. So if the value of z is at 35 or the previous um, previous local maximum is at 35. So here you have to be a bit careful. Uh, Lorentz scaled the axes by a factor of 10. So actually 350 means 35. So if you are have a local set maximum at 35, then the one thereafter is going to be, let's say, at 36. And then there is this second arc of this scatter plot where let's say you are at 400, sorry, where you are at 450, then the next set maximum will be at probably something like uh, 33. But to more precisely see what it means to have these set maxima, let's visualize the signal in the set coordinate. So let me remove the hello world statement and then we will just plot the trajectory over all time steps and then just extract, sorry, the set coordinate, which is at index two. And then we get this. So in the X axis, we now have the time steps and in the Y axis, we have the set coordinate. And again, we see this transient phase here in the beginning. We discussed it also in the previous video where we started our initial condition and we go towards the chaotic attractor. Once we then end up or once we are on the chaotic attractor, we actually see the more typical Lorentz behavior. So this is essentially here, this beginning phase. But then once we are on the chaotic attractor, we always have these peaks and set. So this is basically every time you see this inflection point here. And then we are interested if the set value here, let's say, for instance, was at 43, then the next one would be at 33 and so on and so forth. And this is what we're going to extract out of the trajectory. Let's do exactly that by implementing a function and let's call it find maxima in set. 
and this one gets a trajectory and in order to not overshadow the variable we already have in a global scope i will just use trajectory underscore and then in order to determine whether a snapshot in our trajectory is a local maximum we need to also look at the snapshot in the time before and the time thereafter you might say to the left and to the right and in order to do that we will use this array which has 5000 entries and extract a free arrays which have 4998 entries corresponding to either the snapshot to the left the snapshot in the center or the snapshot to the right so let's do this and call this the set trajectory left which is the trajectory underscore indexed from the beginning all the way to the second to last element so meaning that we go from zero but to 4998 and then index two to get the set coordinate the set trajectory center is trajectory underscore from one to minus one at two and set trajectory right is going to be trajectory underscore from two upwards and again two and then we can use these three arrays to create a boolean array whether the corresponding value that is currently in the center array is a local maximum so we can say is sorry is maximum is going to be is set trajectory center greater than set trajectory left and is set trajectory center greater then set trajectory right and if that is the case we found a local maximum and this boolean array basically can then be used to extract this value from the center array and we get the maximal values by saying set trajectory center indexed at is maximum and return the maximal values with this handy helper function we can then apply it to the trajectory and say maximal values is going to be find maxima and set applied to our trajectory and we can take a look at the maximal values so what do we have here so it's an array with a couple of entries probably less than 5000 entries and they list the corresponding maxima so the first maximum is at 47.8 and this is also precisely the one we see here so it's the one that is associated with the transient phase and the one right thereafter is let's say shortly below 30 so at 29 yeah that makes sense and then we have a couple of ones which are around 30 yes that makes sense and then eventually we will also have ones again that are at 40 and so on and so forth okay cool so these are now all the maximal values in the set trajectory for the Lorentz map we're now going to do a scatter plot that maps from the previous set maximal value to the next one so let's do plt dot scatter and then we can hand over maximal values indexed from the beginning except the last element and maximal values indexed except the beginning and all the way to the end then let's execute that function and here we go then we found this Lorentz map and if we now compare that with what we have from the original Lorentz paper let's maybe first look at the bottom left and here we have a very high density of the scatter points around 30 and this one we also have in our plot here here we also see that this likely is associated primarily with the transient phase in the beginning then we also see that the left arc of the scatter plot is denser than the right arc and this is also in the original plot from Lorenz what we don't have is that the maximum here is a very high one so you might even say it's around 50 so I guess in this particular case we don't see this because we have not integrated further enough so particularly what you might see as the peak of this Lorentz map depends a bit on the initial condition you have 
and of course how long you integrate that it might pop up at some point but overall i think we match the shape of the lorenz map quite precisely for completion let's also add some access labels so let's say plt.x label is previous local maximum in set and plt.y label is next local maximum in set and let's also activate the grid just that's that we have a nicer figure here. This channel is supported by Pasteur Labs and the Institute for Simulation Intelligence. Click the link in the video description to find out more how they merge machine learning and simulation in order to reimagine the scientific method. Also a big thanks to all my Patreons. If you also want to support my vision of free education on advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, then please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. In the next video in this series, we're going to translate the code to JAX to run multiple simulations in parallel and as a data generator for a machine learning approach, which we're going to do then in the video thereafter. Here you will now see similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.